Right. Jenny likes to walk around All right. the other side. We're going right around. We'll go back to our seats. The big question is yeah. how can I make sure I can be in the middle of the line at the right time? Pass through the room. Oh, uh, I don't think you can. This is the time. Yeah. 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 Ye
Uh, I'll come back. Abigail, <laughs> Bella, Natalie, Catherine, Jacob, and John. And uh, they'll, 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 they'll introduce the, 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 themselves and tell, them, tell a little bit about themselves and uh, beep, 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 before they start. So, um, so I'll, I'll give you them. Hello, thank you all so much for having us today. Um, and this is our presentation on Jupiter, Kepler and his third law. <coughs> Here's a picture of all of us together as a class with, by, or on the telescope. And then we're just going to say a little bit about each one of us right now. Um, hi, my name is Catherine Davis. I'm in 12th grade. I'm going to go to Oklahoma University for meteorology. Hi, I'm Sarah Mosheri, and I'm in 11th grade, and I'm considering going to Franciscan University of Steubenville, and um, I think I want to go into social work. I'm Abigail Roman, I'm in 11th grade, I'm looking at going to Oakland University to study veterinary medicine. Oh, um, I'm John Frasillo, and I'm in 11th grade, and I'm looking to go into computer science. Um, I'm Bella Galley, <clears throat> I'm in 11th grade, and I'm considering going to Oakland University for elementary education. Hi, I'm Jacob Mason. I'm a senior at Lutheran High North. This is my second year straight of physics. And I'll be going to Arizona State University next year, fear the fork. And I will be studying <laughs> meteorology slash climatology while I'm there. Hi, I'm Natalie Zowell. I'm in 11th grade and I'm looking at Manhattan uh, College in New York. And I want to go into chemical engineering. <laughs> Okay, so Galileo and his, the use of the telescope. Galileo made huge improvements on the telescope. He made his first one in 1609, and he could magnify objects 20 times instead of only three. He was able to look at the moon, discover the four satellites of Jupiter, observe a supernova, verify the phases of Venus, and discover sunspots. His discovery proved the Copernican system. It stated that the Earth and other planets revolve around the Sun. Prior to the Copernican system, it, held, it was held that the universe was geocentric, meaning that the Sun revolved around the Earth. Here are some pictures of Galileo's notebook. And um, Galileo drew out his visions of Jupiter's moons and how they would orbit. And based on the arrows, the three moons followed a curved pathway. <coughs> So there's four moons around Jupiter. The first one is Io, and it was named on January 8th, 1610. It is said the daughter of Inachus and was changed by Jupiter into a cow to protect her from Eros' jealous wrath. Eros recognized Io and sent a glad fly to torment her, and Io, maddened by the fly, wandered throughout the Mediterranean region. The next one is Europa, and that was named on January 7, 1610. Uh, it was said to be a beautiful daughter of Agenor, king of Tyre. And when Europa climbed on his back, he swam with her to Crete, where she bore several children, including Minos. The next one is Ganymede, and that was also named on January 7, 1610. It was named by a beautiful young boy who was carried to Olympus by Jupiter disguised as an eagle, and Ganymede then became the cupbearer of the Olympian gods. The last moon is Callisto, and that was named on January 7, 1610. Uh, the name was based from the beautiful daughter of Lycaon, and she was seduced by Jupiter, who changed her into a bear to protect her from Eros' jealousy. Here's a picture of Jupiter's four, mean, four moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. All right, here's some facts about Io. Um, of the four Galilean moons of Jupiter, Io is the closest to Jupiter. It's the fourth largest moon in the solar system, and it high, has the highest density of the four moons. The driest known object in the solar system is Io. Uh, Io got its name for the mythological daughter of Zeus. Jupiter's moon Io has extremely active volcanoes, and has a lot of them, and is in fact the most volcanic, volcanically active world in the solar system. It has hundreds of volcanoes, some erupting lava over 24 miles high. Um, it's affected by Jupiter's massive gravity and orbits Jupiter, but it's still slightly <coughs> affected by the gravitational poles of Europa and Ganymede. Uh, Io itself is very cold, but it has spots of volcanoes, and the lava can reach up to 2,000 degrees Celsius. 
The next moon is Europa, and of the four Galilean moons, Europa is the second closest to Jupiter. It's smaller than Earth's moon, but it's larger than Pluto. <coughs> Europa is frozen and covered in a layer of ice, and this leads scientists to believe that there's a very large and active ocean beneath the surface. Um, Europa is one of the most reflective moons in the solar system. The temperature at the equator never gets warmer than negative 260 degrees, and the temperature at the poles never get warmer than negative 370 degrees Fahrenheit. Europa's ocean under the surface is believed to be salt water and thought may contain life. The next moon, it, next moon is Ganymede. It's the largest moon in the solar system. Ganymede is the only moon we know of that has a magnet, magnetosphere. And Ganymede is also the ninth largest object in the solar system. Um, a magnetosphere is a comet-shaped region in which charged particles are trapped or deflected. There is believed to be a saltwater ocean 124 miles beneath its surface, and about 40% of Ganymede is covered by craters, and the other 60% distinctive patterns of grooves that can be to 2,000 feet high and stretch for miles. Ganymede is not very dense, and the temperatures can be as low as negative 193 degrees Celsius and as high as negative 171 degrees Fahrenheit. The last of Jupiter's moons is Callisto. It's the third largest moon in the solar system behind Ganymede and Saturn's Titan. Uh, Callisto has a lot of craters and is the most cratered object in the solar system. The average temperature is around negative 279 degrees Fahrenheit and unlike the three other Galilean moons, Callisto is far enough away so that it remains outside of Jupiter's main radiation belt. Callisto's surface is the darkest of all the Galilean moons, but is still twice as bright as Earth's moon. It's made up of about 60% rock and 40% ice, and there may be water 100 kilometers beneath the surface. The largest crater on Callisto is 4,000 kilometers across. Callisto's atmosphere is very thin and is probably most composed of carbon dioxide. Because of the potential ocean beneath the surface and the low radiation content of Callisto, it is thought that Callisto would be the most suitable object, besides Earth, to colonize human life. So, three of the four moons of Jupiter, uh, Io, Europa, and Ganymede are in resonance. So for every time Ganymede makes one full orbit of Jupiter, Europa makes two full orbits, and Io makes four full, full orbits. the moons being in resonance. Um, these moons have a periodical gravitational effect on each other, and a resonant system occurs between the moons that gravitationally stabilizes itself so that the moons remain in orbital resonance. And um, uh, Jupiter, I, am I, could I draw on the board? Is that possible? Yeah, of course. Sure. Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Jupiter, it acts like, well, Jupiter's moons. Here's Jupiter, right here. Jupiter. And then, um, this is, <laughs> this, is, this is one of his moons. And then this is the center of mass, and the center of gravity. And um, its moon acts like a pendulum, so if it's pulled to the right or the left, <laughs> um, the center of gravity pulls it, pulls it back to the equilibrium. Um, okay. uh, so Jupiter's moons are tidally locked to Jupiter or in synchronous rotation, um, and the effect of tidal locking is that one side of each moon is always facing Jupiter. Uh, this also occurs with Earth's moon. It takes each moon to rotate one side of its axis um, is equal to the time it takes each moon to orbit Jupiter. Um, and an explanation for tidal locking. The gravitational pull between Jupiter and its moons is strong enough to cause the sides of the moons facing Jupiter to bulge up towards Jupiter, while the other sides are forced to press to compensate for it. Over time, the parts of the moon sticking out act as a handle for Jupiter to grab onto, so that the side facing Jupiter stays facing Jupiter forever. All right.
Missions to Jupiter. There have been many extraordinary space missions sent to Jupiter, some in the past, some currently underway, and more still to come. Some of the most successful missions to Jupiter include the Pioneer 10, which was launched in March 1972 and didn't encounter Jupiter until December 1973. This was the first man-made craft to reach Jupiter. Communication was lost in 2003. The Voyager 1 was launched in September 1977. Didn't reach Jupiter until March 1979. It was able to capture about 18,000 pictures of Jupiter and its moons. This craft discovered volcanic activity on the moon of Io. Galileo. This was the first craft sent to orbit Jupiter. It launched in October 1989 and arrived at Jupiter in December 1995. Galileo was able to measure the temperature, pressure, and wind speeds of Jupiter. The Galileo also discovered a salty ocean under the surface of Europa and an iron core and magnetic field on Ganymede. In 2003, it was decommissioned and sent to crash into Jupiter's surface. And then some of the other missions that would have gone to Jupiter include the Pioneer 11, Voyager 2, Ulysses, and Cassini Huygens. And this was the very first image captured of Jupiter from the Pioneer 10. And some current missions is Juno, launched on August 5th, 2015. It is expected to arrive at Jupiter in August 2016. The spacecraft is equipped with instruments to study Jupiter's <coughs> atmosphere, magnetic field, and gravitational field. It's also supposed to help scientists create a full 3D map of Jupiter's entire environment. And this is a picture from the most recent mission that went past Jupiter, New Horizons, and was able to get a very detailed picture of Jupiter's little red spot. And future missions, the Europa-Jupiter system mission. This mission is expected to launch in 2020, and it will take its time and reach Jupiter by 2026. Its goal is to study the moons and figure out if there truly is an ocean beneath the surface of the moons and if life could possibly exist in it. And that's uh, an artist's depiction of what it should look like in space. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Do you know how big that little red spot is? Not exactly. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> 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 it's a Google question. Three times the size of Earth, apparently. That's awesome. Yes. It's three times the size of the Earth. Three times. Uh, three times the size of the Earth. Little All right, so fairly briefly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the life of Johannes Kepler. He was born in Wolfstadt, uh, Württemberg on December 27, 1571. When he was a child, Kepler suffered from smallpox, which left his hands crippled and he had weak vision. He attended the University of Tübingen. Here he was deemed worthy to study the work of Nicholas Copernicus. He wrote the first public defense for the Copernican theory and defended against astronomers and philosophers. After his time in Tübingen, Kepler became a lecturer in astronomy and mathematics at the Providence School in Graz, Austria. He lived a total of 58 years and died on November 15th in 1630 in Regensburg. Kepler first saw interest in astronomy when he was an assistant to the great Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe. Brahe developed the best instruments available at the time. Because of this, he kept the most precise and detailed observations of the planets and stars of his time. Brahe believed that the Earth was the center of the universe, while Kepler believed in the Copernican theory that the Sun was the center of the universe. Brahe studied the movements through observations, while Kepler studied through mathematical calculation and careful thinking. Brahe feared that Kepler would one day become the premier astronomer, so he only showed a portion of his data to him. Brahe died on October 24, 1601 in Prague, and in order to continue his research, Kepler stole Brahe's data. <laughs> so that's a monument uh, to Kepler and Brahe that is in Prague. Brahe's on the left. You can tell without the nose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not gold. Right. Uh -huh. 
Um, Brahe instructed Kepler to observe Mars during Kepler's time as his assistant. While studying Mars, Kepler found two patterns which in turn became his first two laws. The first pattern was that planets move in an elliptical orbit, and the second was that the center of a planet will sweep out equal areas in an equal interval of time. Ten years later, the third law he discovered with the data of other planets, Kepler believed that harmonies within music were found geometrically in the universe. He did find the law that when graphed, the period squared and the radius cubed formed a perfectly straight diagonal line, which in turn allowed him to derive the formula t squared equals kr cubed. And logarithms, which for most of us who are juniors, we just started learning about in our pre-calculus class. But in Kepler's day, all calculations were either drawn out or done by mental math. So Kepler spent a ton of time calculating the orbits and periods of different planets and even more time squaring and cubing these. Kepler would have published his laws as a whole a lot later if it were not for logarithms. In 1616, Kepler became aware of these logarithms, which can turn any multiplication into addition and division into subtraction. <coughs> At the time, logarithms were not proven in the mathematical world, but Kepler proved to the world that logarithms are in fact valid and used them within his studies. Some of Kepler's other accomplishments is that he's known as the father of modern optics. He discovered what caused far and nearsightedness, and he created eyeglasses to correct these conditions. Kepler also invented his own telescope, which offered a wider view of the sky, and he invented log books. Log books in Kepler's day are equivalent to Excel spreadsheets today. He invented Rudolphian tables, which was a star catalog and a set of planetary tables. <coughs> and he then created the Astronomia Nova, which was a 650-page publication that recorded his efforts to understand the orbit of Mars. And this is the most comprehensive work that Kepler created in his lifetime. So the purpose of our experiment was to demonstrate Kepler's third law by finding the radius of Jupiter and the period of its moons. We used the Celestra Nexstar 130 SLT donated by Dr. Dale Parton and the Celestron Burst Color Camera to collect our images of Jupiter. We got up super early. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we did it from November 9th to January 5th. 2015-16. Um, we recorded data as 10-15 uh, second videos to be stacked. We processed the videos with Registrax 6.1, 6 which stacked all our pictures to get a clearer picture. Um, we saved the computer and opened it in Paint. Uh, we recorded the location and pixels of each moon using Paint and put the pixel values in Excel Excel spreadsheet for each moon. We used the Pythagorean theorem to obtain the distance from the center of Jupiter. We made two corrections of time and moon locations and exported the values to capstone for fitting. Alright, so of course there was some error in our data because we're not perfect. Sadly. <laughs> so our first error we ran into was the relative size of the images. I don't know how well you can see this, but you'll notice that when we first started, Jupiter appears smaller, and then later, about the past three months, two months, the size gets bigger. So this can create an obvious problem with pixels. As of November 9th, the diameter of Jupiter is 19.4, and in January 5th, it's 23.2. So that gives us a clear difference. Now on the whiteboard, I'll show you what's kind of happening here. <laughs> So right here, so right here we have the sun, then the earth is right here, not drawn to scale, <laughs> and Jupiter is right there. Now what's happening is earth is orbiting the sun, because that's what we like to do, and Jupiter is too, but it's not as quite as fast as us, because Jupiter can't handle her speed. So the earth is catching up to Jupiter. So when we start taking our data here, Jupiter is a greater distance away from us. But as the time goes on, such as when we get to January 9th, we're here, and Jupiter's only moved a little, so now we're a much shorter distance, 
So now we have this is our air. Because we have an extra distance that we have to take into account now because the size difference is greater. And we solve that by using this equation right here for the diameter equals all this fun stuff right here. <laughs> And we took the time, we took our first day of starting as zero seconds, and then as, just for simplistic purposes, and as we went on, we increased the time in <coughs> seconds, of course, so that we could get the accurate correction needed. Did you calculate that equation, or? Uh, we did. What we ended up doing is, as uh, the days went on, we would plug the time into this equation where the T is, and then we solve with all the numbers and get the correct diameter. So then, okay, does that tell you how to scale your images? Yes, or? yes okay. we, yeah. we made them smaller. Right? We, we assume a linear fit. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? It works. We have a zero math rule around here. But <laughs> <laughs> so why'd you bring it up? <laughs> Don't tell anyone that I like math. <laughs> <laughs> Now, our second error is what we call the time problem. And the reason for this, it goes to the first error as we get closer to Jupiter as the time goes on. And as most of you probably know, it takes light time to reach us from other planets. So at the beginning of our data, it took the light from Jupiter longer to get to us and a shorter amount of time after. And normally we'd say, okay, so we get the data at 2 a.m., that's really what happened at 1.30 a.m., no big deal. But the problem is, since the distance changed, the time it took changed too, which gave us some errors. And we solved these as shown on the next slide. So we used uh, the Stellarium app on the computer, and we found the length of Earth to Jupiter in astronomical units, which is the distance between Earth and the Sun. And that's a very large number in meters. And uh, we plugged it into this lovely sine curve right here. And our data was about from here until here. So we got this nice little, the straight part on the sine curve, rather than where things start switching around on us. And what we really did was, we, uh, took the Earth-Jupiter distance and subtracted it from the last one. And now we use the speed of light, which is, I'll have that number memorized, Mr. Newmar does, but we don't, we don't quite have it down. <laughs> but that's what we plugged in into our Excel graph so that we could get the exact speed of light rather than a rounded number. Now we subtracted this time from the image time and we corrected our time error correctly to get it all like it was for the first day. We subtracted the time necessary by using the sign. And the D equals VT. And then our next error, this one was one of my personal favorite errors to deal with. Question? But, oh, I'm sorry, sir. What, what was the time error on the last day? About 400 seconds. 400 seconds? 400 seconds. 400, yeah. And that's a significant amount when you're dealing with what we were. So yeah. Any more questions about the second error? All right. So the third error was one of my uh, personal favorites. And this one I'll have to use the whiteboard to explain a little bit better, too. I just love this board. <laughs> good, you're going to be seeing a lot more of them. <laughs> oh, don't worry. You'll get your good fix of whiteboards for the day. So we'll just assume the sun's down here so I save room on the board. So we're here, and Jupiter's up here. Now, when we look at Jupiter, we see the moons doing something like this. Now, really, if we were looking up down at Jupiter, what we'd really see is all the moons traveling in their circular orbits. <laughs> But since we're looking from the side, we don't get the luxury of getting this. So as it was shown earlier, we used the distance formula to get our distance based on how high and far they were from the center of Jupiter. 
Now the air comes in, especially in Ganymede and Callisto, because they have much larger orbits, is let's say let's say this is Callisto. Just because I like Callisto. We'll, we'll inhabit it one day, don't worry. <laughs> and Callisto, when we took our data, did something like this around Jupiter. And what happened was there should be a point, according to the sine curve, where the point where the distance is zero. But the problem is when that x distance is zero right here, we still have a y distance, so that doesn't give us zero like it should be. So that's quite the problem, same as when it's here and here. So then we get this little issue of air. Now we could have been finding angles and calculating to fix the air. We didn't have enough time to be able to do that. So to correct for this air, we use the times of the image near the end of the orbits so that we don't have as much of the, the y exponent getting in the way. So it's more just the x. So that helped give us much more accurate results. So that's how we confiscated for the third air. Any questions on that one? All right, that was a good explanation. <laughs> turn your bath on completely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now the fourth and final error that we did is the fact that the Earth does move faster than Jupiter. So as we kind of show in this little diagram that Catherine and I artistically made, was when Jupiter's We'll use Callisto, for example, because I just really like that one. It just, it goes in this normal ellipse, or eclipse. And normally we would want to see the end when it gets right here, wait for it to get all the way around and do its little repeat. But as we start to get to our closest point and farther away, we start to see that when Jupiter's moon is right there, we see it as if it was at the end of our orbit, so it kind of does something like this. So it kind of looks something like that. So if this is us right here. This is Jupiter. Oh, sorry. And let's say this is Callisto's normal orbit. So when Callisto is right here, we see it as if it was right here. Actually, that's more accurate. We see if this was right there because we get this little point right here. So it feels as if, as if this point was here. Then this point feels as if it was here. And it just kind of, we pretty much see a smaller orbit. One more like this. So it displaces what it should actually look like. So this air exists, but we didn't really make corrections for it. But we did do one thing to help it out, and we show that in the next slide, is that we took it at a point where we were relatively is in, in a good spot with Jupiter. So yeah, where it was perpendicular. So we saw the moons more when they were actually at their peaks rather than when they weren't there. So we kind of solve for that. Alright, so this is what our pictures looked like when we took them in the mornings. Can somebody turn some of the lights off? Turn them off for this slide and then next okay, turn them off. <laughs> for this slide. That way they can see the moons. The Callisto is the dimmest one. The Ganymede is the brightest. Europa is in the middle, and, 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 and Europe or, or Io is one of the brighter ones. Um, these are the 
graphs of our um, periods of the moons. All the little points are our data points, and as you can see, we fit it to a sine curve, and it fits fairly well. <coughs> um, this is our amplitude for each of the moons, and the omega, and to find the period, you divide omega by 2 pi. This is the periods and the radiuses that we found, and these are the accepted period and radiuses, so we can see that ours were fairly close to what they actually are, and our percent errors are over here. Yes? Can you explain what a period is, please? Um, it's the amount of time it takes for the moon to rotate around Jupiter. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. No, it's, it's, it's all the technical terms. He's, he's Kemper. Don't no. yes, worry. Yeah. You have to forgive me. No, it's, it's all good. Okay. All right. Okay. And this is how the log of period versus the log of the radius graph formed out. You can see it really. It forms a nice linear graph with not much air really both ways, which is just kind of shows the accuracy of how they really do relate to each other, as Kepler's law does show, p squared equals kr cubed. So it, it really does show how accurate it truly is. So the, uh, the main goal of our, pro of our project really was to end up finding the mass of Jupiter in the end. But first we had to find k, because t squared equals kr cubed. So we need this, we need k. So to find k, we had to use these logarithms, as Kepler did to help him out as he solved for. So we had the equation set up, and we already had a, the m, which I believe, yeah, that's the slope and the ratio was, was shown on the last slide. The last slide. Yeah. See, so the m is 1.5. 1.5. Yeah. <coughs> and then the b also is. There's the, but we pretty much used all the steps you do with logarithms to get the t, t squared by itself, and we got our answer to be 10 to b, which we then solved to get k to equal this number right here, which is a small number, or it might be, no, I think it's that Same. one. I'm sorry. Are they the same number? Same yeah, they're the same number. So either one, whichever one you like more. <laughs> so now we can finally get the mass of Jupiter, which we start from using the equation of the k equals all of that, and we rearranged it so we got the mass to equal everything. So once we did that, we obviously had g as the universal gravitation constant. And with using k from the previous calculation, we were able to plug all the numbers in and get the mass to be that very large number. I mean, if you want me to say all those, I'll go for it. <laughs> if we want to shorten it up 2.159 times 10 to the 27 kilograms, and the actual mass that NASA has obtained is 1.898 times 10 to the negative 27. So compared to our data, we only had a 13.8% error to NASA, and considering we were using a smaller telescope and getting much smaller images, I'd say that's quite impressive. <laughs> I say so myself. I like to think so. Huh? <laughs> Anything within a factor of 10 is yeah, that's good. That's, that's, that's what you want to go for. So yeah, for our last slide, we got everyone's quotes on the experiment. My, I thought it was a wonderful experience, and I did actually take Jupiter to prom. I do have a picture. I wasn't able to upload it, but I uh, did take Jupiter to prom. That was a fun time. You know where Jupiter's man? Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Jupiter was the lady. Oh yeah. Want to get an old pair? And John felt this was very interesting, and Kevin unfortunately couldn't be here today. We said it's a good time, and Tycho Brahe is his bro. <laughs> Don't eat the heels. 
Part of the reason you like Tycho Brahe so much is some of the rumors about his death. Uh, some people think he died a bladder explosion, and he thought that was really fascinating for someone that died that way. And then you have the other theories of mercury poison, even Kepler killing him, but that's highly unlikely. So, might have been his brother. You know, a lot of mystery behind Tycho Brahe. But that's Kevin's bro. Uh, Catherine thought it was a good learning experience. <laughs> and uh, Bella, she's got a renowned interest in astronomy now. There's a quote. Uh, Natalie over here has learned a lot about astronomy, and I think, I think it's safe to say all of us have, but she felt that was a true learning experience. And uh, Abigail does admit it was a lot of work getting up at, there, we had to get her 2 a.m. and look at Jupiter, then go to school. It was, it was crazy, but it, it was fun in the end. It really was. And uh, Sarah, she's over there, and she learned a lot about Excel and Capstone, which is good to learn about those computer programs because they help us to do things like we just did. Because without Excel, that would have been, ooh boy. <laughs> and uh, AJ also couldn't be here. He had a baseball game. And he thought it was interesting how everything just fits in this perfect pattern. And it's just unique how that happens with all four of Jupiter's moons. And how it's just crazy. And uh, James also couldn't be here. He had baseball as well. And he, he's in calculus and everything, and he thought it was a good way to get step outside his little safe zone with basic math and really apply it to something new, which was a good thing to do. And uh, Trevor also couldn't be here, but he says it's nice to see physics in action, because uh, who doesn't like seeing that? <laughs> Gravity. And Mr. Dumar, he said this at the beginning, I, I called this, I don't know how many other people did, we think it's interesting that Jupiter is about roughly, obviously it changes as we show with airs, but it's roughly 465 million miles away, and we only had 14% air. I mean, that's not bad. And Olivia is another student we have, but she got sick in Wyoming, and then she got transferred to a hospital in Colorado. So she's just had quite the last two weeks. We're, we're praying for her. Uh, yeah, I think she's doing well. Better. I think she'll be at school tomorrow. I think she's back in Michigan now, so that's good. Yeah, that's Jupiter. experiments with uh, the Jovian moons, or was he? So, he wouldn't have taken the speed of light into account, so how no. did his numbers jive? You know, like, what was his degree of error? Well, well I'm, not, I'm not sure, but he, was, well, well, he uses six planets. Right. The moons weren't there. So he so didn't know that, that yeah. there were moons. Oh, there. Yeah, he yeah. Used, he so, used he didn't, so he didn't do Jovian He didn't use the moons. He was just yeah, he used Mars. Yeah. He used Mars. Use Mars and then the rest of the planets. And probably only let them have the Mars data. And then get the data later on. Actually, later on, actually, he, he worked with them actually only one year. Yeah. Kepler was brought right. into Bray's Bray's uh, Brian, um, office in, in 1600. He worked about a year with them. And the reason that he brought Kepler in was because he was the only one to figure out why uh, Mars moved into retrograde. And uh, you know, as we pass it, 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 it has great variance in it. And uh, although they communicated earlier, they were not. Uh, they, he wasn't the first to get him interested. Kepler was very interested in astronomy several years before. Uh, not to take any of your data there, but uh, but the uh, but uh, Brahe, um, family did not want to give up any of the instruments or anything that Brahe had done after his death. And uh, you're correct that, that Kepler did steal the material. But he didn't steal the instrumentation. So the family locked up all that. He got the logs. He locked up all the information, and they all the all the uh, uh, equipment rusted. 
by the time he was able to access it. Ken will be giving us the lowdown on Kepler yeah, at one of our upcoming meetings, Sunday. so you're all welcome to come. Yeah, it's like, Monday night. The story of yeah. <laughs> if you want all the dirt on Kepler, Ken has it. <laughs> July 11th, uh, So were you applying Kepler's third law straight? Because I think maybe part of your, your mass of Jupiter um, error may have come from the fact that it's actually Newton's law in reality, in, in Newtonian mechanics. Right. So so you're missing one component, which is the mass of the moons. So right. do you know how much uh, that contributed to the error in, additional to, in addition to the observing error? So we can add to it. No, no we didn't do that. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure what you mean, uh, Jonathan. The mass of the moons... Should not Since the moons have a much, much, you know, like 10,000 or something times less mass than Yeah, that's true. It is a very small uh, component. Their, their mass is irrelevant. And you can't calculate it from, from Kepler's laws. It, it, uh, Io's moon will, uh, Io's orbit will change a little bit when, 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 when they're in line, but not that much. And what about their influence on each other? Yeah, not that much. Okay. Spectacular presentation. First of all, great job, guys. is the data, the imaging, the images you acquired between November and January. You probably said this maybe, but I didn't see it in the first slide. How many nights did you actually image between November and January to get your data? 62. Okay. Wow. So you pretty much every single night. No, it was cloudy. Um, Michigan. But, uh, <laughs> but, but I watch the weather quite closely. And when, whenever there's a clear, you know, you know, hour by, 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 by hour, I would get out there. Now, if you're a teacher and want to do this with, with, with your students, you got to talk to your administration about this. <laughs> they didn't like me so well. I said, you got to stop having them come out at night because they're getting, because teachers are complaining and because they're tired or whatever. So, 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 so I gather most of the data, but I had, I had to make sure that they do it at least once. Okay. And uh, so they come on and get the data, analyze it, process it. So during the course of imaging through all those nights, through the 130 telescope with a little burst color imager, were you able to ever see the great red spot on Jupiter? Yeah. You would? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, 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 the opening image on, on the screen is, uh, is one of ours, too. Uh, I don't know, whoops. Yeah, first one. Oops. I lost it. Yeah. There we go. That that's one of our. Oh, it's not there. It is. That, that that that's one of the images from, from that from, from, uh, with, with that telescope and that camera. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It was it was pretty nice. Uh, you can see the, the shadows of, of the moons going across. Yeah. But but to get the moons, you had to kind of overexpose it a little bit. Yeah. 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 So you only have about half of the uh, students that actually worked on this. You give me the credit for the ones who weren't here. It's not like uh, about as many of you weren't here as the ones who were able to make it. Yeah, the yeah, others. There, there's 12 in the class. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and there's seven here today. Yeah. So, so about close yeah. to half. They're probably umpires. Well, one of the things I wanted to do was have them do a lot of curve fitting. Because they had, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the high school kids don't understand what curve fitting is all about. And, and a side curve is really good for that because you, had to, because you have to seed it. You know, you, 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 uh, I have to give some some, some guesses to, to, to the uh, you know program first, so 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 you have to kind of guess what the period is by just looking at the peaks and then use that and kind of guess at the number and then insert those numbers in and so they had to figure that out. So it's, it's, I, I made them do a lot of curve fitting. So, but could back Yeah, um, like you're a senior. Um, right, both of you others are coming back next year. Are you going to, what I'm asking, are you going to be in the AP 
physics class again, and can we expect to see you back here next year with a new experiment? <laughs> we just have one AP physics class. Yeah. They'll be in my calculus class. Anyway. How about you guys ever consider starting an astronomy club on campus? Well, there's another school that we sponsor uh, down at Gross Point that does have an astronomy club after our been going for years. So you might consider something like that from a club yeah, standpoint. I have to ask, though, before you guys started this project, was this the first time you had the opportunity to look through a telescope from Mr. Dumars? Or have you guys seen objects before through telescopes? Oh. It was my first time, yeah. I so, really had never done it before. So, so did, cool. what did you think the first time you saw Jupiter and the moon through the telescope? It was really amazing to see, honestly, because you don't realize, you don't realize how much is really out there. And, I don't know. It seems so small when you can actually see it up close. It was. Yeah. It was Is that really the only thing you let you look at, or do you scope <laughs> on something yeah. else? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Many of you yeah, see Saturn. Yeah, we looked at the uh, last stars. Okay. Yeah. Last year when I was in normal physics, I came over one night and, or came to the school. I, I didn't go to his house. <laughs> but uh, but we 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 looked at the at Earth's moon, and you could like see like the definite craters actually in the moon. And it was reversed upside down, like Mr. Duma always said it would be. But of course, you don't believe him until we see the person. So, yeah, that was cool to see. And he showed us uh, Venus and Mars and Saturn. It was, it was, it was impressive. I guess, what was your favorite single sight through the telescope? Like, did you see Jupiter's moons doing anything really neat? I mean, for everybody. Did anybody have any memories, uh, or was it mostly camera feed? It didn't really come together until like the end. I mean, I guess because we're ta you're taking pictures of it still, so it didn't really, I don't know if it really clicked until we really finished the experiment of how it all played together. So. I'd say another cool part of it too, going off of what Sarah said, is kind of, you like, you see like this, just this dot in the sky, and you're, when you're younger, I say like, oh, like, what's that? Let's look at the stars and act like we know where they are. Like, hey, like, there, there's the Big Dipper, yeah. And then when you actually go and you look at this dot, you realize it isn't a star and it's actually a planet. Then you zoom in, and there's these four tiny dots around it, and you just kind of go like, wow, that's pretty cool. Imagine the There, there was one thing left out of the, the list of things that, that uh, Kepler invented, and that was science fiction. So, yeah. so that's an interesting thing to look into. He was, he was a very interesting guy. Yeah, he, he, is a, he was a good man. That was the first time we heard that. I wanted to give you one, one little fact that you may want to adjust, and this is just a couple things because we do that sort of thing. Uh, actually, Ganymede was discovered six days after the other three. It was uh, January 13th, 1610. It was, okay, and he did, because Ganymede was behind the planet mm -hmm. during that period of time every time he looked. Just thought I'd give you that. Also, it's probably EO, not IO. <laughs> they said EO. They said IO. Eh. Well, well, one, one of them said more. I said both. 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 It's like the name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the name <laughs> we didn't it's I -O. I -O. There's, there's no uh, agreement on this. Man. Don't worry Don't about it. it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to agree amongst ourselves. We have that too. I have, I have a grandson named. E-I-A-N, that is But he's not Roman. <laughs> but those are the only things that I, you know, and I'm yeah, If you I'm look a, up the, the you guys pronunciation, were, it's I O. Like I said, you guys were just spectacular. I'm just, I'm just blown away. Last question. Have you guys been out to our observatory to look through our telescope? They have not. No, we have. Next Saturday. Next Saturday. Next Saturday. Next Saturday. Next Saturday. Next Saturday. Saturday. Next Saturday. Next Saturday. Don't, don't miss you know, Mars. Mars is incredible right now. You can see clouds on it. Yeah. The club has much bigger telescopes than the future. Oh, I believe it. <laughs> I hope so. Since he got me involved, I bought a new one. <laughs> Uh-oh. So I'm getting up there. <laughs> So we'd love to see you come out and look through our club. Yeah, I think you'll get a kick out of it. Yeah, fourth Saturday of every month, starting around 7, 7.30. No charge. That's Bring awesome. your friends. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Bring your parents. Yeah. <laughs> Bring your other students.
You know what I find very interesting? Because this, this was really nice. But approximately half of the adult population of the United States does not know that the Earth revolves around the sun. Oh, boy. Right. Oh, yeah. It was either 48% or 52, I forget, but approximately yeah. half the adults <laughs> in the United States don't know that. They don't care. If, uh, if you had the luxury of time, you know all those errors that you're trying to correct for, and some of them you literally uh, you know, correct anywhere near as much as you'd like, and, you know, time limitations and stuff. If you could tighten that up as much as you possibly could, uh, how much greater percentage, uh, how, how much more accurate, you know, would you think you would have been uh, in terms of eliminating that, uh, you know, that that uh, final percentage of error, you know, uh, how much how much more accurate do you think you would have been? The radius didn't change much. If, if you look at the per percent, 1.6, 1.4, 1.6, but, but time is very different. Um, 0 0.026, 0 0.03, 0 0.3 at the end. So I think the time would be a lot different. So uh, maybe 8% yeah. or 9%. Thank you. Yes. One last Thank round you. of applause for all the presenters. Island at 12 Mile or north of 12 Mile on Van Dyke, um, the National Coney Island to continue discussing. Everybody's welcome to attend. I realize it's a school night, but if you want to hang out with astronomers and talk about Kepler or Jupiter more, that's the place to do it. And we have a lot of food up here. Please, everybody, take the food. We do not want to leave anything behind. So if you all want to treat yourselves, how about it? And uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Let's uh, move on.